You're listening to the sermon podcast from Meadowbrook Church in Cheyenne, Wyoming, with Pastor Keith Miller. Um, would you all please rise um, for the reading of God's word? Um, if you would like to follow along and you don't have a Bible, there is one under a chair in front of you. Um, if you don't have a Bible at home, please take that one with you. We want to make sure that everybody has the ability to read the word of God for themselves. So today's verses are going to come from Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of, G- of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the administration of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before briefly. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to mankind, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to enlighten all people as to what the plan of the mystery is, um, which for ages has been hidden in God, who created all things, so that the multifaceted wisdom of God might now be known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you not to become discouraged about my tribulations um, in your behalf, since they are for your glory. Please be seated. God, you are able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. You can do the impossible. You are awesome. You are awesome. We ask now, Lord, that you will do that thing in in us, that you give us eyes to see. You give us a heart that would receive your word. You give us ears to hear. Whatever it is in these verses and in this sermon that you want your people to hear this morning, including myself, that you would just make that clear and that you would make it plain that you would take the authority of your word and the power of your Holy Spirit to do the thing that only you are able to do, and that is to change lives. We ask that you would do that, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. How many of you have heard of the early church father by the name of Polycarp? I'm just curious. Okay, wow. Actually, a lot more of you than the first service. Uh, In the first service, it was like, I don't know, like five people. Uh, if you don't know who Polycarp is, that's fine. You, you don't really, it's, it's not that important. I just want to share his story. Polycarp was a bishop in Smyrna, which is about, I think, like 35 miles north of the city of Ephesus, right? So Paul wrote this letter to these Christians that were gathered in Ephesus. About, uh, about 100 years later, a bishop of Smyrna, 35 miles just north, uh, would be brought into uh, the arena uh, under Roman authority, and he would uh, he was going he would be executed. He was executed. He uh, his name was Polycarp. He was the last known, the last surviving, the last surviving uh, person who had who had direct contact or had known directly an apostle. He was discipled and he was mentored by the apostle John. At eighty six years old. He was uh, in his home praying. He was praying because he knew that the Roman authorities were, were uh, planning to arrest him. A week before, uh, one of his protégés was, was, was thrown into the arena where, he, where they set wild animals after him, and he died for his, for his faith in Christ. So, so Polycarp knew that that was probably what would happen to him or something like it. So he... Uh, was praying. He expected that the Roman authorities would arrive at, at any point. They did. They entered into the home. 
they had swords and they were ready to arrest this man. When he came down from the steps from praying, he, uh, they were surprised. There's an old, feeble man, and so he doesn't, didn't seem as, to be much of a threat. And he asked them, you know, he offered them food and, and drink, and he asked them if they could give him one hour to pray. And they actually said, yes, you, you can pray. And uh, so he, he prayed. He prayed. They, after he finished praying, they, they arrested him, and they placed him on a donkey and uh, rode him to the place where he would be executed. He entered into the arena, and one of the things that uh, the Christians were labeled were atheists. The reason why they were labeled atheists in those days was because they didn't worship all the gods that Rome worshipped. So they were, called, they were deemed atheists. So uh, as he entered into the arena on, on this donkey, uh, the, the crowd began chanting, down with the atheist, down with the atheist. Speaking of Polycarp. Uh, he was brought before the proconsul. The proconsul said to him, you know, if you just reproach Christ, I will set you free. Meaning if you just deny Christ, I'll set you free. You won't, you won't die. To which Polycarp declared, 86 years I have served him and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Speaking of Jesus. The proconsul continued and said, swear by the fortune of Caesar, to which Polycarp again replied, Since you vainly think that I will swear by the fortune of Caesar, as you say, and pretend not to know who I am, listen carefully, I am a Christian. They sentenced Polycarp to death by burning. Uh, they were going to nail him to the post that they, that they would burn him on. And he said, there's no need to nail me. I will stand here and I will die for my king. So uh, they didn't nail him to the post. They tied him, though, and they lit the fires. As they lit the fire, Polycarp could heard, be heard praying this prayer, O Lord God Almighty, the Father of your beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, by whom we have received the knowledge of you, the God of angels, powers, and every creature, and of all the righteous who, who live before you, I give you thanks that you count me worthy to be numbered among the martyrs, sharing the cup of Christ and the resurrection to eternal life, both of soul and body through the immortality of the Holy Spirit. May I be received this day as an acceptable sacrifice, as you, the true God, have predestined, revealed to me, and now fulfilled. I praise you for all these things. I bless you and glorify you, uh, along with the everlasting Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, to you with him through the Holy Ghost be glory both now and forever. Amen. They lit the fire, and the story goes that the, the fire would not consume his body. Like, it, it, it would not even get close to his body. So he actually didn't die by, by being burned to death. They actually uh, they, they pierced him with a, a sword or a spear or something, and he, he bled to death, and he died that way. And here's, here's why, why share his story. Well, last week, we we're looking at the same passage in Ephesians, and, and I concluded with, with, really, with verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 13. And I just was highlighting the, the, the careful words that Paul, the apostle, chose in, in, in writing this letter and what he wrote in verse, three, or verse 1 of chapter 3, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. Not the prisoner of Rome, not the prisoner of Nero, who was most likely the emperor during the time that Ephesians was written, but of Jesus Christ. Highlighting that <laughs> Nero could do his worst, Rome could do their worst, but at the end of the day, I'm in prison and Jesus is still Lord. He was, he, he, this didn't catch him by surprise. He, this was not outside of the scope of God's sovereignty, that this is under the will of, of my king, my savior, and that's why I'm here. And in verse 13, therefore I ask you not to become discouraged about my tribulations in your behalf since they are for your glory. So that's what I ended with. And, and so I asked the question last week, and I'm going to ask it again, and that is, what is it? What is it? What, what was it that, that, that gave the Apostle Paul the confidence and the, the calm and the patience to be able to say what he said while in prison? Most likely, 
He didn't get out of prison after he wrote the epistle to the Ephesians. Most likely, it was sometime after this, after he wrote First and Second Timothy, or at least Second Timothy, that he was beheaded for his faith. I said last week, I said, you know, I said, if Paul had been diagnosed with cancer, he would have said the same thing. If Paul had lost somebody he loved that was dear and close to him, he would have written the same thing. And what is it? What is it? Well, what it, is, what it was is that he, Jesus is his corner, was his cornerstone, and he was standing on the foundation of the Word of God. And uh, the same was true for Polycarp. And, and the same is true for you. Like if, I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what, you're, what you've experienced this week. I don't know what kind of news you've heard. I don't know what is discouraging your heart right now. But if you're a Christian, Jesus Christ is your cornerstone. And the Word of God is the, is the foundation that you stand on. And I, I want to just focus the rest of our time, verse 8 of Ephesians chapter 3, through verse 13, and just, just highlight some things for you that I think will encourage you as, as, they, as, as these verses have encouraged me. Paul wrote in verse, in verse 8, he said, To me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. I was a persecutor of the church, and yet God saved me? That's, that's what he's saying there in verse 8. And to enlighten all peoples as to what the plan of the mystery is which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. That, that, that there's this mystery that is Jesus and, and that he's commissioned me, Paul writes, he's commissioned me to be able to tell people about this. And not just Paul, but, but anybody who has placed their faith and trust in Jesus. And he goes on, he says, verse 10, so that the multifaceted wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. So, so like, a, like a good Baptist, I have, two, I have three points. No poem this time. <laughs> uh, and the first is this, it's simply this, is that God's plan is great. So, so God's mystery, so the title of my sermon really is the, a mystery, a hidden mystery celebrated. Like, that, that there's this mystery, and it's obviously Jesus. You know, I, I said last week that throughout, throughout the Old Testament, we see God pulling the curtain back just a little more, or pulling it open just a little more, a little more, just so we could see more and more of who this Jesus is. Like he, he, he's, he, he's the seed that was promised to Eve that would crush the head of the serpent. He's, he's the one who's promised that through Abraham all the nations would be blessed. And little by little, God was opening that curtain for, for, for all to see till the, the day that Jesus was born. And he, as you hear me say often, he lived the life that we could never live and he died the death that we all deserved. And on the third day, he rose from the grave. But God's plan is great. God's plan is great. So Paul said in verse 8, he said, To me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. Like there is this mystery who is Jesus. He is, he's a second and greater Adam. He is a more permanent and perfect sacrifice. He is a greater Moses who mediates a new covenant. Like this one is the mystery that, that the Old Testament was pointing to in the New Testament for, for us New, Te New Testament saints. That's who we are. We look back and we see this Jesus who is the mystery that, that the Bible points to. In Hebrews, the, the letter to the Hebrews in the very opening verses, we read these words. God, af God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the pro in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, he has spoken to us in his son. Well, well who is his son? Well, he, he's the heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. He is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. He upholds all things by the word of his power, when he made purification of sins, what did he do? Did he have to get back up again? No, he sat down. Well, why did he sit down? Because the sacrifice was only needed once. 
Like his death on the cross is sufficient to cover your past, present, and future sins. It's enough. He is enough. He's enough. And when the Apostle John had a vision and an encounter with the resurrected Christ in the book of Revelation, he, he, we're told this. He, he said this. Let's read this together. Ready? When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Like, who has the keys of death and Hades? Do you? Meadowbrook, do, do I? No, he does. Jesus is the first and the last. He's the living one. There's this... There's this popular phrase that's, I've even heard it in the church, and the phrase goes something like this, that you're enough. Well, the Bible, the testament of the, the, testimony of the Bible and the testimony of the Word of God is you're not enough. I'm not en- enough. Paul wasn't enough. Like, what does that even mean? Like, you're enough. Think about it. I, I, he, it Paul was not enough, but Jesus was enough. Jesus was enough. That's why Paul could be in prison and say, you know what? This is going to work out to God's glory and for my good and for the good of the church. Even if they cut my head off, even if they cut my head off, I will enter into the glory and the presence of God and I will receive the crown of life. Like, like Jesus is enough. And for the church, if you're a Christian, like Jesus is enough. He's enough. Uh, Paul, you know, in verse 8, like he, this is why he says, I'm the very least of all the saints. I was a persecutor of the church. Like, that was my M.O. I, I was on my way to, to, on the Damascus Road to do more harm to the church. And Jesus knocked me off my horse, and he met me there on the Damascus Road, and my life has never been the same. I, I don't know how many of you know this, but it, it's either, I can't remember if it's 1 Corinthians 10 or, or 2 Corinthians, but Jesus, or not Jesus, Paul said, you know, I had this thorn in my flesh, and I prayed for God to remove this thing in my life, and I kept praying and kept praying, and you know what he said to me? He said, no. (laughs) He said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. That's why, like this shenanigans, that you're enough. You're not enough. Jesus is enough, though. That's the good news. That's the good news. And and so, uh, Paul and the Ephesian Christians, and Polycarp, a hundred years after this letter was written, and you, what's true of every person that has placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you, Meadowbrook, have received the unfathomable riches of Christ. So what, is unfa- what does that mean? What does unfathomable riches mean? Does it mean can you measure? Can you measure what, what we received in Christ, these riches? Can you, can you put your finger on like all of what that means? No, that's why he, Paul deliberately and, and specifically uses the word unfathomable. You can't wrap your mind around it. And, and we're the recipients of it. That's, that's part of the mystery here. Part of the mystery is, uh, the, the, the point of the mystery is Jesus, the, and the other part of the mystery is that we are the people that he has redeemed. And we, we're called to him as, as his bride. And so God's plan is great. And here's the crazy thing. Like, he wants to use you for his glory and for the good of the world. Like, he has called you, Christian. He has called you to engage his mission. Not because you, are on the, you qualified for the A team or the B team, is there a C team? Is there a C? I don't know. Like, like I, I'm learning language in sports. Like, I, I was not in sports in school, but my son is. And, and so, like, we didn't even qualify. We didn't even, like, there was a time, like, there was no, I don't think there was a, in high school, I, I don't even know what it was. I've tried out for baseball. And, like, back, those were the days where they didn't mind hurting your feelings when you're in school, right? Like, you, what, <laughs> this is what they would do. They would put a list out in the hallway for everybody to see. Remember that? I, and who was on the list? Everybody that was good enough. And anybody that was not on the list was not good enough. And if you tried out, like everybody knew, you were not on that list because you were not good enough. 
Like, we are not good enough. <laughs> like, there was nothing in God, like, God, that God saw in you and in me and said, oh, yeah, I really need that person on my team. Like, I, I, because I can't, I can't do this redemption thing without, without this person. That's not the way it works. Like, we didn't even qualify, and yet he chose you anyway. Like Jesus said, he said, you, church, are the, what? The salt of the earth and the light of the world. That's who you are. You're salt of the earth and you're a light of the world. What does salt do? It preserves. What does light do? It lights up a dark room. Like that's who you are if you're a Christian. And God's plan has always been for his people to serve as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. You don't have to be able to stand up and preach a sermon to, to, to fill that role. If, if you're a Christian in this room, God has given you a story. And that story is meant to be shared and to, shared with, to be shared with others. That's how you function as salt, and that's how you function as light in the world. And it's always been that way. Like that's, it was true of Adam and Eve. God said, fill the earth with Yahweh worshipers. With, with Abraham, he said, I want you to, uh, I want you, you know, through your seed, I will, I will bless the nations. And with Israel, he said, look, this is what you, uh, I'm calling you to be my kingdom of priests. You, you are to be salt and light in this world. They didn't do a good job at it, but that's what they were commissioned to do. In Malachi chapter 1, verse 11, again, God pulling the curtain back even further about what this mystery is. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be what? Great. You can say it. It's fine. Yeah. Like, you're not being graded. Like, my name shall be what, church? Great. Great. Among the nations. And in every place, frankincense was going to be offered to my name. And a grain offering that is pure. What is he talking about there? He's like, all, all through the, the nations will worship me one day. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of armies. Uh, like we exist for the glory of God and for the mission of God. If you're a Christian, like what is the glory of God? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question with a question. <laughs> um, that's what good rabbis would do. So <laughs> I'm not a rabbi. Um, I like pepperoni pizza. So <laughs> like, but this is what this is this is what they this this. This is, what, this is my question. Is there anything or anyone that's greater than God? If God is who God is, by definition, can there be anything greater than him? No, right? There's nothing greater than God. So if God is great, then what is the most loving and best thing that God could give you? Himself. We exist for the glory of God. It's about him. And we also exist for the mission that is, like Malachi chapter 1, verse 11, we exist for the mission that he is doing in this world. I've said uh, before, you, if any church or any Christian confuses the two things that God is most passionate about, which is he's passionate for his glory and he's passionate for his mission, and you somehow think that life is about you and about what's going on in your world, you've lost your way. We exist for the glory of God and for the mission of God. And Paul, like, highlight, I mean, he points this out all throughout the epistle to the Ephesians. And, uh, and he's doing this work. And it's good news. Like in chapter 2, verse 10, like if you're confused as to what, why do we exist? If you're a Christian, why, why were you called? Why did God choose you before the foundation of the world? Why did he redeem you through his son? Why has he sealed you with his Holy Spirit? Like why did he do any of those things? Verse 10 of chapter 2, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Walk in what? Walk in the good works that he prepared beforehand. We exist for the glory of God and for the mission of God. And how do we, like, how, how do we know that his mission is going to be successful? Because, because of who Jesus is. And Paul even answered that question in the first chapter. He said in, at, the begin, at the last part of verse 19, these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, 
far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in, the, in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and made him head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. It's because of Jesus that the mission of God will be accomplished. He's the king. He's the king. Paul recognized that. I am a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nero may have thought he put me in prison. The Roman Empire maybe thought that they, that, I was put in prison, that they put me in prison. But I'm in prison because of the sovereign will of God. Like this, this, It didn't catch God by surprise. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God didn't say, whoops, I missed that one. I, like This has been the plan all along. Redemption through Jesus Christ has always been plan A. It was never plan B. That, Paul makes that point. Over and over and over again in Ephesians. He makes it again in Ephesians chapter 5, where he says, you know what? Hey, let me tell you about a profound mystery. A husband, a man shall leave his wife, uh, leave his family, and not leave his wife. Uh, <laughs> that would be bad. Uh, a, a, man, a man shall leave his mother and father and cling to his wife. And Paul said, that, this is a profound mystery because here's what makes it so profound and, such, and so mysterious. The marriage between a man and a woman is actually pointing to something much greater, and that is Christ and his relationship to the church. And so God will accomplish his mission because of Jesus through his church, which leads me to the second point, and that God's motive is central. So it's not only great, but it's central. It's central. Hey, what, do I, what do I mean by that? Well, it's about his glory. It's about his fame, the renown of his name. And this is a good thing. This is a good thing. And Paul, Paul stood on that uh, reality. Polycarp stood on that reality. These, Paul was encouraging the Christians to stand on that reality. And, uh, and my, my friend uh, Tim and Betty Jo Smith are standing on that reality. I just I found out uh, here's this man who, when I was in high school, right after I became a Christian, he, was, he had a profound influence upon, in my life. And now he's the lead pastor of Crossing Community Church. And so uh, the, 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 I live, like, before me, he used to live in that apartment in the big farmhouse. It was three floors, and then the corner was the, this apartment. He lived there at one point. And then I kind of followed in his footsteps, but he was involved with the youth ministry. He was involved with our... With, um, with uh, different aspects of the church where he, he, he was able to speak into my life. Well, Betty Jo, uh, for six months, was experiencing lower back pain and hip pain and just couldn't quite figure out what was going on. She went to a chiropractor, and, the, and, the, and the, that didn't help. And so she went to her doctor, who I also know from like my youth, and, uh, and went, went to the doctor and ran, did an MRI, scheduled an, M, an MRI just to see maybe, I guess, just to see if there's a bulging disc somewhere. And when they did the MRI, they called, them, called Betty, Joe, and Tim in and showed, her that, showed them that she had a mass in her spinal, along her spinal cord. And, uh, and so I done, ran further tests. Obviously, the, the mass was cancerous, and now the cancer's through her body and in her brain. Who is she gonna, well, like, what is she going to stand on? I mean, if you read their, uh, if you read the webpage that they put together, just charting their course and their journey, the only thing that she has to stand on is, Je is Jesus Christ. He's the cornerstone and the foundation of God's word. And knowing that e e even though cancer may be the result or may result in her death, not a hair on her head will perish. And it's, it's the same thing Paul is standing on. It's the same thing Polycarp is standing on. And my hope for you, brothers and sisters, is the same thing that you're standing on. And it's the hope that I have that I'm standing on that hope as well. When, when unwelcome news comes into, into my life, that I'm able to, to stand on, on these truths. And, and, it, and the fact that God's motive is central, that he's passionate for his glory, it's good news. The greatest and most loving thing that God could do for Keith Miller is to, to redeem me and to purchase me through the blood of, of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who's the Lion of Judah, so that I can know him and be known by him. 
That is the most loving thing that he could do for me. And it's the most loving thing that he could do for, for you. And he, he opens, like in the letter, you know this, if you've been tracking with Ephesians, like he opens Ephesians with, with that point. Like, why, God chose you before the foundation of the world. Let's go to, let's go to the, the next slide. God chose you before the foundation of the world for, for, to the praise of the, of, of the glory of his grace. He redeemed you through the blood of Jesus Christ to the praise of his glory. He sealed you with the Holy Spirit to the praise of his glory. And in the next slide, it, just to show this to you, like, like, it's all about that. It's all about his glory, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory. And that is good news. That is good news. It's good news for you. It's good news for me. And, and, and you know, you, you remember this, that in chapter one, we're, we're told that we, not only have we been made uh, children of the living God through what Christ accomplished on the cross, but we are now sons and daughters. And because you are a son of the God of all creation, because you are a daughter of the God of all creation, you are an heir of the God of all creation. But that's not all. You are his inheritance as well. And, and he will not lose what belongs to him. And if you belong to Jesus, God will not lose you. <laughs> this is why verses like Romans chapter 8, verse 1 are uh, such good news that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, our Lord, and who are sealed by the, Holy, by the Holy Spirit to confirm and to affirm this work that God plans to continue to do in you and will do it until it's complete. And he will not lose what belongs to him. Ephesians 1, verses 8 through 7, you know, to him or in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our wrongdoings according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. And why is he doing it? He's doing it for his glory. He's doing it for his glory. And if you're, you know, if you're still confused about that, I love 1 Corinthians. If you ever read 1 Corinthians, you'll learn that the Corinthian church, they were a mess. They were like, they were a mess. They were just upside down and just confused and all kinds of stuff. And so Paul wrote, uh, 1 Corinthians to correct some of the mess. And in the very opening chapter, he said, we preach the foolishness of Christ. Uh, you know, and, it, and, and the result is, uh, is life. And then he continues to go on in verse 26 of chapter 1, and I won't have the words on the screen. I'll just read them for you. For consider your calling, brothers and sisters, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the insignificant things of the world and the despised uh, you know, God has chosen. That's us. That's Meadowbrook. That's Keith Miller. The things that are not so that the things... So, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no human may boast before God. But it is due to him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. That's the point of chapter 3, verse 10, right? So that the multifaceted wisdom of God, what is the wisdom of God? It's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, just fleshed out. You were not on, you, 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 we didn't qualify to be on his team, and yet he found us. And why did he do that? To shame the wise and to shame the strong and to show the world, look what he can do. Look what he, not because he needs to do that, but because he wants to, because he wants to. And so verse 10, so that the multifaceted wisdom of God might be made known through, listen, through Meadowbrook Church, through the church. That's you, that's me. It's part of the mystery that Paul is talking about here. Through the church, to whom? Well, to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. Don't let that escape your notice. Like, he, he is doing this thing in you and in me, uh, and he's making it known through the church, that is, people of every ethnicity that, has placed their, that have placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We are now one people, covered under the blood of Jesus Christ, belonging to his tribe. We're one people, regardless if you're from Africa or South, you know, far, far East Asia or, or, or the Middle East 
or, or South America where one people, regardless of language and regard, regardless of ethnicity. And he's doing this. Why? Well, he's displaying us to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. Well, what is he doing? What is he doing? Well, from choosing you before the foundation of the world to the redemption of your soul through the blood of the Son to the sealing of, uh, uh, of the Holy Spirit by the same power that raised you from the grave, he is displaying his power in and through you, Meadowbrook, before the angels in heaven and the demonic realm. And he's saying, this is what I'm doing in their lives. And the angels, the angels marvel, we're told. First Peter chapter 1, verse 12, look it up sometime. They stand on tiptoe. They marvel at what, at what God is doing in your life and, and what he's doing in the life of, uh, uh, of people who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb from every walk of life. They marvel at it. They stand on tiptoe. Uh, every once in a while when I'm like at the grocery store or at some store and there's somebody who will just say is vertically challenged, <laughs> I've been asked, hey, can you get this uh, on the top shelf? I'm like, sure, no problem. Uh, but have you ever, like, do you remember as a kid, like you would be just, you stand on tiptoe trying to see what's just like just out of sight? You remember that? Um, that's what angels do. Like this is just like what we're experiencing. It's like they see it, but, they're, but they marvel over it. Like this is crazy that God would, would redeem these people created in his image who were hostile towards him. He was the one who chased after them. He chose to do that before the foundation of the world. And then he died for them through the person and work of his son Jesus by becoming a curse for us on a Roman cross on a tree. And then on the third day rose from the grave sealing their redemption, and then he sealed them with the Holy Spirit. Like, how does that work? Because they'd never experienced that before. And they, so the angels marvel at this. There's a passage, uh, Revelation chapter 5, which uh, I want, like, this is all of heaven is singing this song. Not just, not just those saints who have gone before us, but all of heaven and the angels so let's, let's, let's read this together, ready? Worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, and blessing. To him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be the blessing, the honor, the glory, and the dominion forever and ever, amen. All of heaven is singing that. Uh, the angels are singing it. When they see you, they see the redemptive power of God on display. And they, they celebrate. The demons see the same thing. They see the same thing that the holy angels see, and their response is they tremble. You know why they tremble? They don't tremble because of any power you have. They tremble because you are a reminder that God's rich mercy great love and all sufficient grace is not available to them we are the recipients of it it is a reminder that judgment is coming it is a reminder that there is a place reserved for them it's called the lake of fire and they tremble when they see the redemptive work that, that, that god has done in you and is doing in you and through you they tremble the cross that made our redemption possible serves to remind the demons that all evil has already been defeated at the cross, right? You, like, you, Christian, remind the demonic world that their final judgment is coming. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says that we will stand in judgment over angels, like over the demonic realm. We will stand in judgment over them, and they tremble. And their response is certainly terrifying fear at what we remind them of, but it is also violence. Their response is violence towards, towards, this, towards the people that God has redeemed. It, that's why they, their response was violence towards the Apostle Paul. That's why he was in prison. At least that's what they thought was the reason why he was in prison. Um, their, their response was violence towards Polycarp. 
and their response in this crazy upside down world is violence to all those who have been redeemed by Jesus Christ because we remind them of their judgment and they stand in terror over what is coming and they hate us for it. They hate us for it. Uh, and, and so we'll get into it. This is why you have Ephesians chapter 6. We'll get into that eventually, right? But that's, but, but that's, that's what we remind them of. We are on display for all of creation to see that God is capable of doing the impossible when it comes to redeeming lost mankind. And why does he do it? Well, Isaiah 48 verse 11 says this, for my own sake, for my own sake, I will act, for how can my name be profaned and I will not give my glory to another. It's all him. So yeah, you're not enough. Don't ever say you're, you're enough. You're deceived if you think you're enough. You're not enough. We need Christ. He's enough, and, that, and, and he is all that we need. In, First Corinthians, or in Ephesians uh, verse 11, in him we also have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things in accordance with the plan of his will to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be the, to the praise of his glory. Amen? Which leads me to my final point, and that's God's purpose is eternal. And this is brief, I just, but I, I want you to see this in verses 11 and 12, that this was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Hey, this, this is his eternal purpose. It's been the plan, always plan A. It's been plan A all along. It was the, in accordance with the eternal purpose in which what he is working in and through us. Like he, this is part of the mystery. The mystery is, is that there's a church that has always been plan A. And that you, church, like you, Christian, you're a part of that. And God is planning, God, God's plan and his intention is to redeem the nations and, and through, the, through his son, but he wants to use you as his mouthpiece. He wants to use you as his hands and feet, not because he has to, but because he wants to. And that's a mystery. But he has chosen to do it that way. This is, like, we are the recipients of the unfathomable riches of Christ, and now, as the church, we're called to tell other people of how they can also be, how they can become the recipients of God's unfathomable riches uh, in Christ. It is the unfathomable, unfathomable riches of Christ that Polycarp was, you know, sentenced to death for preaching. And it was the same reason why he was able to stand there confident, knowing that, you know what, they might kill me, they, they're going to slay me, but not a hair on my head will perish. The fire may consume my body, but there's, there's no lake of fire waiting for me. It's everlasting life. It is the unfathomable riches of Christ that the Christian has received and has been commissioned to bring to all peoples, Far East Asia, South America, the Middle East, Mexico, Canada, wherever. The, our purpose is for God's glory and to engage his mission. You are a citizen of his kingdom first. And, secondary, uh, and second to that is a citizen of whatever nation you find yourself in. And in our case, it's America. It's because, it is because you, Christian, have received the unfathomable riches of Christ, it places you in a third category of people. And that third category of people, that people group, is the people of God. Think about that. Like, we're bound together by the blood of the, of the Lamb, all of us. And that we're, the bond that we share together as Christians is stronger than any bond that you have with a biological relative, uh, somebody who's related to you biologically. Like, we're going to spend eternity with one another. You know that? <laughs> like, we will be celebrating the, the lamb who is the lion together. We'll be singing the same songs. We'll be, you know, when God makes all things new, the new heaven, new earth, like, we'll be, run, we'll be running through the same fields. We'll be celebrating the lamb uh, in, in song together for all of eternity. We're covered under his blood, and we belong to his tribe. It's the eternal purpose which God carried out in Christ Jesus. You are the church. Like, Christian, you are the church. And because you are the church, Jesus is your groom and you are his bride. That's weird for guys to think about, but we are the bride of Christ. 
What that means is that we are the apple of his eye. He is madly in love with his bride. That love was displayed on the cross. It continues with his faithfulness to us even when we're faithless. And he's committed to, to completing this work in you and, uh, until, until the day of redemption. And he will not lose any who belong to him. You are his inheritance. Again, verses 10 through 12 says that the multifaceted wisdom of God might now be made known in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confidence, uh, confident access through faith in him. Amen? Like, that's, that's us. Like, I, I, I said this in the first service, and, and the worship team can come up, by the way. I, and I'll say here, like, if you, even with, with what we see here today, if this is your first Sunday here, I mean, praise God that you're here. Um, I hope that this is an encouragement to you. If you've been tracking in this Ephesians series, and like this doesn't like light, light a fire under your butt, like, like you just want to get out and tell people about this, like if this, if this isn't like, if this isn't filling your heart with praise, as one, as one preacher said, who's now home with the Lord, S.M. Lockridge, he said, your wood is wet. Like you, there's something off. Like this is, for you, Meadowbrook, and this is for me. This is good news. I came across a quote by uh, Warren Wiersbe that I thought was so good. I, the words will be on the screen so you can see this. I, I thought it was so good. I cannot improve upon this, and I thought this would be a really great way to conclude this sermon. And this is what he said. He said this of the church. He said, this great truth concerning the church is not a divine afterthought. Now let that settle for a minute. Like, this great truth concerning the church is not a divine afterthought. It is part of God's eternal purpose in Christ. Here's sage advice. This is what he says. To ignore this truth, to ignore this truth is to sin against the Father who planned it, the Son whose death made it possible, and the Spirit who today seeks to work in our lives to accomplish what God has planned. So do not, do not mock or diss the bride of Jesus Christ. Collectively, we are his bride. And he is committed. Listen, you might not, I mean, like, like, you may know people who are not committed to, to his bride, but he's committed to his bride. And, um, and, and he's madly in love with her. And if he's madly in love with her, what ought be the response of his people regarding the people who have been redeemed by him, our brothers and sisters, right? So I think that's the best way to just end, end this message. We are the church. We are the apple of his eye. He, he loves you. And if you're not a Christian in this room, my encouragement to you is, man, don't wait. Don't wait. Give your life to Jesus. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the grave, you will be saved. Uh, let's stand and let's sing this song together. And as we prepare our hearts to sing this song, listen to what Jesus said. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. And uh, to find him, to, to place your faith and trust in him, is to find rest for your soul. Thank you for listening to the Meadowbrook Church Podcast. For more information about our church, visit meadowbrook.org.